people have a variety of ways of uh, describing the book of Revelation. And uh, if any uh, two people sat down to try to give some descriptive phrase to describe each chapter, and they didn't look on each other's paper, they probably would come up with some divergent points of view. Both of us probably would be very good. The way that uh, I have tried to understand Revelation by trying to picture it in my mind is what's being said, is I believe that uh, it is a tower of truth. And I say that because the book of Revelation is a picture, uh, a lot of pictures, and each picture is like the different floors of a tower. And so I envision chapter one as being the firm foundation because it's primarily a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember the Bible says, other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now upon that firm foundation, we then come to chapters two and three that belong together because they contain the seven letters that were written to seven different churches. And so the church is built upon this firm foundation. And in each one of these letters, we get a glimpse of how different congregations may be. What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? What are their challenges? What should be their primary concerns? And all these are dealt with to make us understand today that though there are separate congregations of God's people meeting around the world, yet each congregation is going to have its own characteristic. And some will be very strong, some will be very weak. Some will be strong in one area and weak in another area. But the variety of churches that existed in Jesus' day and in every day since uh, will be uh, characterized by chapters 2 and 3. Now I put chapters 4 and 5 together because it's very obvious in chapters 4 and 5 we're brought to the throne room of heaven. And in chapter 4 we see God on his throne and in chapter 5 we see Jesus Christ at the right hand of God. Now when we come to chapter 6 which we concluded in our study last week I call it a journey to judgment because the first four seals that are broken are pictures of uh, conquest, of war, <coughs> of death, and of famine. And I think uh, that pretty well describes how history is playing itself out. There have always been people who wanted more than they had. There have always been wars to get what you want. The result of wars usually ends up in a lot of people dying and many people going without needed food, but it's at that point that I need to remind myself again, though that is true in our physical world, it's also true in our spiritual world. And we who are the soldiers of Christ are involved in conquering the world for Christ. The last thing that Jesus said before he ascended into heaven to his disciples, uh, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. Now, days before that, up in Galilee, he had said to the crowds of people, remember he made himself uh, known to above 500 people. Most people think that that crowd, that large, probably was his final meeting in Galilee. But that concludes the last two verses of chapters of uh, the book of Matthew. And he said, go into all the world and uh, teach every nation and baptize them and continue to teach them. And I'll be with you always if you teach them to continue. Observe everything I've commanded you. So this is his heart's desire that the whole world should know why Jesus came to the earth and what he has done for us at Calvary and even uh, at his resurrection and now while he's at the right hand of God on high. And so uh, in the sixth chapter we saw that journey unfolding. Now the last picture in that chapter was the sixth seal that was broken and it was not a pretty picture. So we had a week to dwell upon a picture that uh, obviously we need to see clearly, but not one that we want to be a part of. You remember in the fifth seal, that was not a very pretty picture either, but it certainly was better than the one in the sixth seal. The fifth seal showed us a picture of Christians who had been killed for their faith. Now our hearts break when we realize that people who are trying to do right are paying the supreme price for doing so. And they're portrayed then as, uh, 
at the base of the altar of sacrifice, and they're asking the Lord a very significant question. Lord, how long are you going to let this continue to go on? And the Lord, in essence, is saying it's going to continue. Uh, don't you worry about that. I'm in control, and I know what I'm doing, but uh, there are other people who are going to join you. And we know from the first century now that we're living in the 21st century, that is true, that throughout every century, people have died for their faith in God. That doesn't mean that God has forsaken his people. And that doesn't mean that we've lost our basis for hope in Christ. Uh, our future is secure. He wants us to know that. But he also wants us along the way to realize that throughout history, Christians will have a lot of questions. They may not understand God's answer. But Revelation is a book that you don't want to finish before you're finished. What I mean by that, don't stop reading until you've come to the end. So in the last, cha uh, last chapter, last paragraph, rather, of chapter 6, we have a picture of the non-Christian world. And it's an even worse picture. Because these are people with no hope. Now, it's not pleasant to see Christians dying for their faith. But it's good news to know that they're not dying in vain. But here are people that are not ready to meet God, and they know it's too late. And in that final hour, they're crying out for the rocks and the mountains and the caves for anything that will hide them from the presence of God. They're not ready to face God. But they're going to face God, and they're going to face an eternity of separation from God. And so we have a glimpse of that, which is going to happen someday for eternity in our final words of chapter 6. Now, in chapter 7, we are introduced to an interlude. And in answer to the uh, second question that I ask uh, as we start studying Revelation chapter 7, I, I would challenge you to use your imagination. And what I would ask you to do is to consider the fact that you are not seated around tables as you are tonight, but that you're seated in an auditorium. And you have been looking at the stage, and you just watched a drama unfold which has presented you with the various pictures that I've just reminded you of. A picture of Christ, a picture of the church, a picture of heaven, and a picture of the events of history. And now the curtains are closed. Now why are they closing the curtains? <clears throat> We're using our imagination. In my imagination, I see that while the curtains are closed, they're going to change the scenery behind the curtains. Mm -hmm. But they want to keep our attention so that we are not distracted when the curtains once again open up. So while the curtains are closed, there are some actors that come out in front of the curtains. They're making their appearance and they're saying, uh, we want to make sure that you understand two things. The first thing we want you to understand is, all of you who are alive now and you're serving the Lord, you're on the winning team. Your future is secure. I want you to know that. The second picture, beginning with verse 9 down to the end of the chapter, is going to be a picture of, what about the people who have already died? That is, those who died as Christians. Those who died as the people of God. Are they okay? And out there in front of the curtain they're saying, oh yes, they are. And in essence we could sum it up with the words of the Apostle Paul when he said, for to me to live is Christ. To die is gain. And those are the two pictures that we're going to see in the chapter that we're studying during this hour together. Let me begin reading then with verse 1. After this, this is Romans, Revelation chapter 7. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. Now in the very opening words, after this, what is this? I think he's saying, after you've seen these first few scenes in this divine drama, 
Before we go on to another scene, I want to picture something to you. So after this refers to after having broken the first six seals. Now, we're about to break the seventh seal. And when you break the seventh seal, that's going to give you another picture. So he's just simply changing the film and the camera and saying, all right, you've used this reel up, you've seen this, put a new reel in there, show you this, and you're going to watch this. So it suggests a change of scenery. It's not suggesting later on in time. Because what we're reading in Revelation is paralleled again and again throughout the entire history of the church. And we're living in this picture. We're living in the book of Revelation. And it's very important for us to see where we are in this picture. So after this is just simply a change of scenery, but not uh, a change in regards to time. Chronology is not a part of this. Now, what is the role of the four angels? Angels are always messengers or servants of God. And so God is using the angels to do something that's very important. Now, why is he using four? Because four is the earth number. And what these angels are going to do is going to affect things here upon this earth. Now, what are the four corners of the earth? Now, remember, people have not always believed that the earth is round. In fact, I understand, I cannot prove this, but I understand that some people suggest that there are some people that still believe we live on a flat earth. I don't know where their mind went to ever <laughs> hang on to that kind of a picture. But, uh, you know, to believe in the flat earth would suggest that if you travel so far, if you, go, if you don't watch yourself, you're going to fall off the edge in some ways. But this is a picture of a flat earth. But this is a picture that was painted a long time ago. So what is the picture of the flat earth? Well, it is a picture of a square piece of ground, I guess. And so up in that corner and that corner and down this corner and that corner, uh, the four corners. Now, we would say that the four corners would be northeast, and northwest, southeast, and southwest. Now, what are these angels doing? They are told to hang on to the winds that come from these four angels, from these four directions, from the four corners. Now, in Bible days, they had the idea that if a wind came from either north, east, south, or west, no reason to really be concerned. But if the wind begins to come from a corner, watch out. We're in for a great storm. Now, that picture, I think, fits the book of Revelation. What are they holding here? These four winds. By the way, do you think the wind can do a lot of damage? Yeah. How can you live in Florida and not believe that? In fact, how can you live almost any place with all the cyclones and the tornadoes and the hurricanes? And the wind can do a tremendous amount of damage. So when he tells the angels, hang on to the wind, he said, listen, there's going to be some damage that comes, but this is not, we're not ready for it yet. So I see that this is a picture of withholding judgment. Is judgment day coming? Is the day coming that people are going to suffer the consequences of their own evil deeds if they're not Christians? Oh, yes. But that time has not yet arrived. So he's saying, hold the winds at the four corners because there's some things I need to do first of all. What does he want to do? He said, now before you get a real feeling for what's really going to happen, let me just uh, make sure you understand where we are and who we are and how you can be prepared for these bad days that are certainly going to come. Because you can escape them, or if you don't escape them, you can go through them victoriously. And that's exactly what I want you to do, go through them victoriously. So, the question is asked, the winds, what are the four winds? I think they are judgment, divine visitation, when God is going to give to the people what they have asked for. Because whatsoever man soweth, that he's going to reap. Number six, question, what are the four angels doing with the four winds and why? They're holding it. In other words, is judgment day coming? Yes. Has it arrived? No. But it's coming, but not yet. 
So they're withholding that. This is a picture to realize that we haven't reached that time yet, but it is coming. Number seven, what part of the picture of this verse is visible evidence of withholding the wind? <coughs> the trees. If you're in a car and your windows are up and you've got the air conditioner on so you can keep cool, you may not realize whether the wind is blowing very strong outside that car or not if you're just sitting there. But if there's a tree standing by, look up there and look at the leaves. That'll give you an indication. Is the wind blowing? So the part of the picture in this picture that we see in this part of Revelation is the tree that gives evidence of the fact that there is a breeze blowing. Now, number nine, uh, number eight rather, what is the significance of another angel ascending from the rising of the sun? The rising of the sun would be east. And when anything came from the east, as is portrayed in the Bible, this would mean that this is coming from the very presence of God. You may remember that uh, the tabernacle, when it's set up, the door into the tabernacle always faced the east. So when the opening of the tabernacle was opened, then the sun could brilliantly shine into uh, that uh, place where God met with his people. So uh, it's really uh, something that is indicating here that what you're about to see is God's activity. It's coming from the very presence of God. He's in control. He wants you to see this. Now, what does the angel from the rising sun bring? He brings the seal of the living God. Now, in this particular instance, we need to understand what the seal really is. A seal assures protection of what is sealed. Now, a part of this is review for you. I know that. But let's make sure we really understand this. In Bible days, one of the documents that was sealed was a will. Sometimes people have a will today and they put, may put it in a safety deposit box. Just simply to protect it and make sure it's not touched until the appropriate time comes that the person who made the will is deceased and now the appropriate people are present to reveal the contents of that will. Well, in Bible days, a seal would be placed upon a scroll. They didn't have books like we have them. They had scrolls where the pages were rolled up. And they'd tie them with a ribbon or a string or something like that. And then where the knot was, they would melt some wax on that knot. And then the person that's witnessing this would take his signet ring and stamp his the ring down in that hot wax and leave the impression there which meant that when the time came for opening the seal, the person whose signet ring matched that impression in the wax identified himself as the one who could open the seals. Now, we've already indicated, as we began the study of the last chapter, that the one who qualifies to break the seals is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, so the word seal gives uh, security to that which is sealed. Now, in this picture, in chapter 7, you and I are going to have the seal. And where's that seal going to be? Right up here in our forehead. What's the significance of that? Well, obviously, it's going to indicate something that uh, everybody's going to see. It's not something you hide. There it is, staring you in the face. Uh, so a seal indicates identity as well as security. So who are the people that are really secure? These are the people that have the seal on their forehead. Now remember, what that saying is, you are God's people if you have that seal. And if you have that seal, you don't have anything to worry about. That's why the Bible says, be anxious for nothing. But in prayer, with thanksgiving, let your supplication and requests be made known unto God. We have security. We have God's promise, we have His presence, and we are clearly identified as His people. So the uh, seal is uh, making that very obvious to us. Uh, 
I need to get back here to some of the questions that I haven't used yet, don't I? Good. Ten. Number 10, what instructions were given to the four angels in verse 3? It said, do not harm the earth or the sea or trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. So uh, he's saying, uh, make sure that we uh, pause here in the history of the world and just take a look at what's happened, what is happening, and what is yet going to happen. And that's what we do every time we sit down in a moment of quietness to read our Bible to find out from the Old Testament where God's people have been, where we are today, and where we're going to be someday. Number 11, what is the significance of the seal being placed on their forehead? I've already indicated that to you, but let me just remind you of a beautiful illustration from the ninth chapter of the book of Ezekiel. You remember that story? Ezekiel contains a lot of visions, a lot of pictures, uh, very graphic pictures, some of them. But in this particular picture in Ezekiel chapter 9, here's a man, uh, I'm using the King James Version now from my early reading and studying of God's Word. He had a writer's inkhorn by his side. And this man is told to go down into the city and to begin at the temple and to put a mark upon the forehead of everyone that he saw sighing and crying for the abomination. That simply means everyone that is really living a life that shows their concern about the well-being of their fellow man. Identify them. Put their mark right up here. Now after he has started the temple and then goes out from the temple and puts that mark upon everybody that is so concerned about <coughs> others and wanting the best for others after they've all been identified, <coughs> then there are six other men that have a slaughtering weapon by their side. And instructions are given to these men, you go down and begin at the temple where the man with the writer's inkhorn began. And I want you to kill every man, woman, and child that does not have that mark on their forehead. And he says, don't show any pity, don't be show any mercy, just destroy them. And so they went down then and destroyed every man, woman, and child beginning at the temple and working out that did not have that identification on them. Now obviously, in this picture that we're just now looking at in this chapter in Revelation, the imagery is borrowed from that portion of the Old Testament. As you heard me say when we began our study of the book of Revelation, the best book to ever prepare you for the book of Revelation is the rest of the Bible. And uh, there are more references in the book of Revelation to things that happened in the Old Testament than there are verses in the book of Revelation. And many people never stop to think about that. But this is just another reminder that uh, what we read in the Old Testament is going to be very helpful for us in understanding and appreciating that. Uh, all right, now the seal is going to present, uh, prevent any tampering. Uh, it's going to present what is real. And let's see what's going to happen then when the seal is uh, broken and with contents are revealed. Beginning with verse 7, I'm at verse 4, rather, in chapter 7. I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Now that means these, this many people have a mark upon their forehead. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Dan, 12,000. Uh, Gad, rather, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. And from the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. Now we have 12 twelves, and that gives us 144 and 144,000. So how many were sealed? All of God's people. The number 12 is a signature of God's people. I think the dual 12 would be the 12 in the Old Testament, the 12 in the New Testament. Thinking of the patriarchs of the Old Testament that are here identified, and thinking of the apostles in the New Testament mm -hmm. through whom God has given his word for the rest of us to read and study as we are here tonight. 
So the number 1,000 is a complete number, and it's also a number that symbolizes the church age. So I think that he's talking about the church as it is today, awaiting the time of the Lord's return. So these were the ones who were sealed. Now, number two, what suggests that the tribes of Israel should not be taken literally in verses four through eight? Here are some things for you to keep in mind. And I think that this is so important all the way through the study of Revelation. Remember, way back in chapter one, very opening verses, this is sent to you by signs. This is symbolism. These are pictures. So see them as that which is going to bring the truth to your mind. So as we look at this, we think, is there any other list anywhere in the Bible of the 12 tribes just like this one? And the answer is no, there isn't. Now I misread while I was reading through it and I corrected myself. Remember when I said Dan? Dan is not mentioned. Then it's also interesting to notice who was mentioned first. Judah. He was not the oldest brother. Reuben was. And then furthermore, you read through this list and you find out, uh, well, Manasseh's mentioned. Well, Manasseh has a brother, Ephraim. Ephraim's not mentioned, but Joseph is. Well, now Manasseh is the son of Joseph. Now Manasseh, I can understand, but when you get Joseph, didn't, didn't Joseph include Manasseh? Well, not in this list at least. So Joseph takes the place of Ephraim, who is not mentioned. Uh, and of course, when you look at all this, you say, well, okay, how do you explain this? My personal opinion, and it's just that, is that God did not intend for us to understand this literally. He understood for us to understand this symbolically, as is indicated by the number 12 and the number 12,000. So, What's he saying? I think he's saying all of God's people. And so he's deliberately giving a listing of the 12 that is different than anything else you see simply to underscore the fact that if you take this literally, you've got some problems for which you don't really have a good answer. Now when you say, well, who took the place of Dan? Well, you could say Levi took the place of Dan. Okay, but well, how are you going to explain the fact that Dan was not included at all? I don't try to explain that. I know that people have suggested reasons why they think he was left out, but uh, I just think that the, the order in which these names are mentioned and the names that are or are not included is just a way of reminding us, don't understand this literally. Now, why am I saying this? Uh, I'm afraid that much of our misunderstanding in our religious world today is a result of seeing things literally that God did not understand, under, expect for us to understand literally. For an example, who is God's Israel today? The church. Does that mean that the church is God's Jew? Yes, it does today. Was that always true? No, it wasn't. Are we descendants of Abraham? The last few verses of the third chapter of Galatians said, yes, we are. And he identifies who they are. Those who are baptized into Christ are the offspring of Abraham. Abraham is the father of the Jewish nation. The Jewish nation was the people of God. Today, we are the people of God. In the second chapter of Romans, verses 28 and 29, in the ninth chapter of Romans, verses 6 through 9, both passages will, in essence, say, they are not all Israel who are Israel. That sounds like a contradiction. No, it isn't. In other words, he's saying, just because you physically may be categorized as a Jew, you are no longer categorized that way with God. God says, my people are not identified any longer by physical birth. Was there a time when they were? Yes. yes during the Old Testament time. <coughs> but now... We're identified as his people by birth, but it's not physical birth. It's spiritual birth, born of water and the Spirit. And so in all these passages, we have uh, indications that God many times will use words that had a literal 
and a physical